Have you ever met a serial killer? I think I did, and I'm relieved that I didn't know it at the time. I used to chat a lot on MSN Messenger when I was in college. I was a shy and kind of nerdy girl, so talking and flirting with random guys was much easier when it was online instead of in the real world. We used to have a lot of internet stores that you could go and pay a couple of bucks and use the computer a couple times a week. I mean, it was the early 2000s, and technology wasn't available to everyone just yet. Sometimes it was just writing, and sometimes we'd use the cameras. There was this one guy that I remember really well. He was a lawyer, or so he said. He always refused to use the camera, even after we'd known each other for about a year. He was witty and funny, and I really liked him. He was a little bit older than me, and he was pretty good at sex talk, which was somehow appealing to a girl in her late teens. He was always asking personal questions. Where do you live? Do you live alone? Do you live with your family? Do you have a boyfriend? Can you travel alone? Of course, I always diluted the conversation and never gave him any information. Sometimes I would tell him a fake story, but then he would ask details and details, and I would end up telling him that it was fake and laughing about it. You would think it would bother him, but it didn't. He would always laugh and say it was just my wild imagination. I think our virtual relationship lasted for about three years. Now that I'm thinking about it, it lasted until I graduated college. One time, he came to town where I was living. I was in my senior year. He said it was for work and insisted that we meet up. I agreed and told him about a coffee place where I like to drink coffee. He declined and said he had to work all day and that he'd be available after 9 p.m. and proposed that we meet in the apartment where he was staying. I thought it was weird, but at the same time, I was excited and eager to meet him in real life. I finally agreed and told myself, I'll just pass by and say hello and that'll be that. We agreed to meet the following day. He sent me the address and because I know the area, I knew I would find my way easily. Unfortunately, that day at university, we had to prepare for a conference, me and a group of friends. The meeting took us longer than I'd planned, so I sent a message to the guy telling him that I had an unexpected bit of work to finish and I couldn't make it. He never responded and I never heard from him again. A few years passed and I moved to another city where I was pursuing a PhD. One day, out of nowhere, I received a mail from this guy. It was just a regular mail, where he was asking how I was doing and what I'd been up to lately. Honestly, I was a little bit surprised. We exchanged a few emails after that, and he told me he'd be happy to meet up if I was able to make time for him. That made me laugh. I thought, well, maybe it's time to finally meet this guy. Where I was living happened to be an hour away from the city he was living in. After a few back and forths and some more emails, he gave me the address. The location struck me as odd, but I didn't really think about it at the time. It was a bit out of the way, in a city I had visited a few times before. It was a new neighborhood. I didn't even think people were living there yet. The way I was supposed to get to his house was a bit weird, too. He said he would guide me on the phone and tell me how to get to his place. I took the train anyway, arriving at the station, and took a cab as I headed towards his neighborhood. I had to stop in an intersection and follow his instructions on the phone, as he said. When the cab arrived at the intersection, the driver asked me if I was sure where I was going. I lied and told him this was the right area. I was surrounded by suburb villas, the kind with high walls and well-maintained front trees. It was a bit unnerving as I walked on the street where he said he lived. It was quiet. Too quiet. At the end of the street, there was a dozen duplexes with well-maintained hedges instead of fences. The street was empty, but for two cars that passed by before I took a turn into an alleyway. I called him and he took me from there. I followed his instructions until I stopped in front of a duplex with a garage and a well-maintained front lawn. There was no car outside and all the windows seemed to be closed but on the upper floors. The space in front of the garage was unexpectedly clean and for a moment I thought maybe I had missed the right house. That's when I heard him say on the phone, I can see you, come on ahead inside. Then I looked up and saw the curtain dropping. I felt a real sense of unease, but I ignored it. Come on, don't be silly. I know this guy for almost six years. I'll finally get to meet him in person, I said to myself. I stepped towards the front door, pushed it when I came inside. It was the entrance to the duplex, leading up to a small lobby with stairs. The lobby was completely quiet, as if no one else lived here. I was about to close the door when, for some reason, I decided not to close it and just push it quietly. I went upstairs and saw number 11 on the door on the right. Before I could tap on the woody door, he opened it wildly. 
The inside of the apartment was kind of dark because of the lack of natural light. He stood there, wearing a black shirt and gray pants and bare feet, which was odd. He was partially bald and neatly shaved. He smiled and stuck his hand out for me to shake. Well, hello there. You finally decided to do it, huh? Something in his features was unsettling, as if he was up to something. It was as if I could see in his cold gray eyes something I couldn't explain that made me feel in danger. I reached out my hand to greet him. The moment his hand touched mine, a chill ran down my spine. Yeah, finally, I responded out of politeness. My uneasiness must have shown on my face. He shook my hand, but he didn't let go of it, and his grip tightened. I don't like it. I don't like this at all. You can let go of my hand now, I said, with false amusement. He grinned, but he didn't let go. At that instant, I went into fight-or-flight mode. My heart started racing, and all my senses went crazy. He grabbed my hand and tried to pull me inside. I threw politeness out the window and yelled, Let go of me! I said let go! I was standing on the threshold. I gripped the wall with my left hand and tried to pull away from him. When I looked up, I saw the creepy expression of a predator and a smile that said, I finally got you. I was not only trapped, but I also knew that no one would hear me outside the duplex. Even if someone could hear me, they'd have no idea where the screams were coming from. He wasn't a big guy. He was around my height and maybe a little overweight. Otherwise, he was able to easily overwhelm me. So I took my chance and let go of the wall and stepped inside. It caught him off guard and I grabbed the doorknob with my left hand and began to slam the door repeatedly on his arm as he tried to walk me inside. He finally let go of my hand and I heard a grunt as he fell over inside. I thank God for my decision to leave the front door open. I ran through the quiet alleyway without looking back until I reached the intersection. I looked behind me, but I saw no one, so I continued running. I couldn't find any cabs in the area, so I ran nearly ten minutes before spotting a cab. While running after him, I yelled the taxi down and waved my hands. He must have seen me in his rearview mirror because he came to a complete stop. I dashed to the cab, shaking uncontrollably as I got inside. The driver gave me a wide look and was about to ask me a question when I blurted out, To the train station! Please! Hurry! He gave me a brief look before resuming the drive. I arrived at the station, purchased the ticket, and then boarded the first train to my hometown. I switched off my phone because I was afraid that he would call or message me. When I arrived, I went to the train station convenience store and pretended to look for something. I knew they'd have cameras there, so if he followed me, I'll be caught on camera. I spent nearly ten minutes wandering between the aisles. Finally, I went up to the cashier and bought a bottle of water. On my way home, I took two cabs in opposite directions to confuse anyone that was following me. I didn't feel safe and, until I got home and shut the door. For a brief moment, I considered calling the police, but what would I say to them? He didn't do anything, I hadn't been harmed, and I'm an adult who understands what I was doing. I cursed my stupid lack of self-preservation. I told no one about this misadventure and vowed never to go through another dangerous situation like this again. I never heard from the guy after that, but it took several months for me to completely forget about the encounter and move on with my life. Until this morning, that is, when I was reading the newspaper and noticed a familiar face, a face I'd never forget. The photo was titled MSN Predator, the serial killer who lured his victims to his home and never let them leave. According to the article, all 24 victims were young women between the ages of 17 and 23, whom the killer met on Messenger. During the interrogation, the defendant stated that some of his victims had been chatting with him for more than two years, and only one girl had slipped between his fingers twice, as he put it, because she was somehow smarter than the others. Good evening, everyone. It's me, Dr. Plague. Thank you so much for joining me for tonight's story. If you're too spooked to go on, then I'll understand if you want to bail out now. But if you think you could handle a little more, go ahead and click one of those other videos you can see displayed on the screen. If you enjoyed yourself and you're not already subscribed, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Maybe hit that notification bell so you don't miss any of the spooky stuff we do here. Maybe even leave me a little comment. I like it when people comment. If you think you might like to support the show more monetarily, you can always come down to Patreon. Or maybe buy a book. I have links below for both. Speaking of patrons, let's go ahead and thank our patrons. Thanks to Janet for being our Spooky Skeleton Tier contributor. 
Thanks to Zeronin, Emily Coltsfoot, Martha, Marianne Schuler, and Jennifer Damron for being our Ghostly Reader tier contributors. Thanks, guys. We just couldn't do it without you. If you haven't come on down and checked out Patreon yet, what are you waiting for? We have lots of cool tiers and lots of cool rewards down there, especially to my Ghostly Reader tier contributors, which make up the bulk of it. They get a book whenever I write one, signed on their doorstep, ready just for them. If that sounds like something you might be interested in, come on down and have a look. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.